thank you very much so welcome everybody it's lovely to see you here today and uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar so as Anne said so the first one back um, after the the summer break so we thought we'd start again with an introduction to the EBI resources um, it's a webinar which we gave earlier in the year but there's been a number of changes to the EBI website since then so a good opportunity to really guide you through how you can find your way around the resources we have so as Anna said I'm the scientific training coordinator at EBI so I manage the the training program um, but so here today just to focus more in on on the resources we have how you can find them how to access them and then also to give you some more ideas on where you can find help and support for using them as well so I'm going to take a little step back before we start and just remind you of who we are um, in case you don't know much about us so we are EMBL EBI or the EMBL European Bioinformatics Institute and we are a, a source of, of public biomolecular data. So we're a, a trusted resource and a trusted source of, of such data. And though we are sort of Europe's home for data, we are actually a, a global resource in that respect in that we are um, used by um, scientists from across the globe. We are part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. But really, our aim is, is to, you know, work in, in terms of benefiting humankind by helping really in the advancement of scientific discovery. So, you know, our focus is on, on bioinformatics, so on the, the analysis of, of data, as well as, as I said, making sure the data is there for you all to use. Um, but really, it's trying to, to help by providing that impact to scientific discovery by putting all of this data out there. So as I said, we are part of EMBL, so I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about EMBL and, and who we are as well. So um, this gives you a quick snapshot of the, the various sites which make up the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. So we are split across Europe. Our main headquarters and the, the initial, the, the first part of the laboratory is in Heidelberg in Germany. And the focus there is very much on basic life sciences, so a lot of molecular research, there are also a number of core facilities there, for example, um, in gene core imaging facility, etc. There is another site in Germany in Hamburg, which is focused on structural biology. And we also have another structural biology site over in Grenoble as well. Um, we also then have sites in Barcelona and Rome that are focused on tissue biology um, and Rome focuses more on epigenetics and neurobiology. The one thing I guess that sets us apart um, from the others is that we don't have any laboratory facilities on, on site. So we are a, a dry um, research site and it's all computational, though some of our research teams are involved in, in laboratory research. But um, as I say, we're the only site that doesn't have laboratories, whereas the other five sites do. And this just gives you a quick overview of, of where we all are. So EMBL is an intergovernmental organisation and we are we were set up by 10 member states coming together back in the 1970s who decided that a, a molecular biology laboratory across um, Europe was required really to try and again um, improve and have a home for, for molecular biology um, research in Europe. And since then the number of states that are involved in, in EMBL has grown significantly so um, EMBL member states um, provide funding to enable us to exist and also provide steer on the kind of research we're doing etc and as I say there's a number of 27 member states at the moment we also have an associate member state in Australia and prospect member states in Estonia and Latvia as well and as I say we can we, you can see from this diagram that we're, we're quite spread across Europe so to come back to the EBI again, so say Emble EBI, we are based on the Welcome Genome Campus. So we are, we are based just outside Cambridge. Um, the Genome Campus being famous for where the UK part of the Human Genome Project happened. So a significant proportion of the sequencing for the Human Genome Project happened there. And it's it's no um, no mistake that, that we we are there. So, you know, basically because the, the Sanger Institute and the sequencing facility is there when a um, a bid was going out for the European Bioinformatics Institute. It was put forward to have it hosted in, in Cambridge so that it was next to where the sequencing effort was happening. So, as I say, we're on a campus with a, a number of different organisations now as well. So the Welcome Sanger Institute and EBI being, being the largest. Um, we then have other groups such as Open Targets, Elixir, Genomics England, and then a number of companies as well that are based on the campus. So if you do get an opportunity to come and visit the campus, it's a fantastic campus to visit. So, um, you know, we, we do run courses on site as well. So maybe one day you'll have the opportunity to come and join us then. 
So now I'm going to start to tell a little bit more about what we actually do, the kind of data we have available, and then take you through the ways in which you can start to actually find the data that's of interest to you. So what do we do? Um, this is actually our mission for Emble BI. So it's a five-fold mission. Um, the first part of that being to deliver the data resources, to make sure that we are delivering resources which are not only ways of, of being able to um, safeguard data that's sent to us and is able to be put out there to share it, but you know is, is also usable data so you know that you can actually um, make use of the, the data and the, the associated information that is there with it. We also then have a number of research groups at, at Emble EBI as well who are working on a range of different um, life science related topics um, and it's not just about, you know, sort of trying new bioinformatics algorithms, this kind of thing. It's, it's using bioinformatics and using that data to actually generate new knowledge. So, again, um, adding to that advancement of, of human knowledge and, and, you know, treatments, etc., for, for disease, a whole range of different things. The third thing here then is obviously what we're here for today. So in terms of training the next generation of scientists. So again, it's not only about um, using the data that we have. So obviously all of that public data that we hold, that we, we share with everybody, but it's also enabling scientists to become more competent users of their own data as well. And we train in a whole range of, of different aspects of data. So from actually managing the data as you're generating it through to various types of analysis of that data as well. We also work quite closely with industry. So we have a, an industry program where we work with a number of companies across the pharmaceutical, agri-foods and consumer goods um, areas. And again, we provide the, a pre-competitive space really where they can discuss and, and come up with ideas. And a number of the ideas that have been generated through that program have then been translated into useful resources for the general scientific community as well. So things such as open targets have come out of these discussions. Finally, we also engaged in, in coordinating bioinformatics in Europe. So on the slide and the, the Welcome Genome Campus, I've uh, mentioned Elixir. So Elixir is a, a European research infrastructure which is focused on, on biological data. And that came out of being a, a special project of EMBL. And the role really is to try and coordinate all of the, the data that, that's being generated and used across Europe. There's a lot of data being generated. We can't look after all of it but we can work with colleagues and across different countries and across some of those more, you know, specific database in different countries, again, to make sure that all of this data is held sustainably so that people can continue to benefit from it. In terms of numbers, this is just a really quick snapshot to show you the number of people who are actually using um, Emble EBI data. So, you know, 107 million requests to websites every day, 41 million unique IPs, um, in terms of our online training, it's nearly 500,000 um, unique IPs accessing it last year. And we currently hold about 390 petabytes of raw storage. So this is the amount of, of computer storage that we actually have to keep all of that data, to hold that data there um, so that you can all then use it. But where does this data actually come from? So, as I said, we are not generating that data. Some of our research teams um, within the EBI may be involved in, in projects where some of that data is generated. Obviously, across the various EMBL sites, data will be being generated. But the majority of our data comes from scientists from across the world. So, laboratory scientists who will be doing all sorts of, of experiments, various different types of research questions they're trying to address. The example I've given here shows you, okay, we've got a, a mouse share, we're doing a sequencing experiment. Um, that particular experiment has been added into um, the, it's in the Array Express um, database here. And then we've got a, an associated publication as well. And, you know, there is a, obviously a huge push to get people to put their data out there for others to use. So, you know, to work in an open manner. Um, for some data types and for some publications, you need to submit your data to a particular repository or to a public repository so that you can actually publish. Um, and, you know, it's, as I say, it's a, a really big effort to try and get people to share more of the data that they're generating, because even if you've used it to answer one question, it may well be usable by others as well. So, as I say, the data comes from, from scientists from across the globe and our role really is to then try and get that data out there as quickly as we can for others to share. The one thing to note is that if you are publishing, you don't necessarily need to have to need to get the data out before you publish. 
we have ways it, with the various databases where actually we can make sure that's held for a little bit first it can be made available to reviewers for example but then it can actually be set live once the publication has gone live if you wish to however more and more people are actually publishing the actually publishing the data through the resources before they may be producing publications on it anyway so as I've said, data comes from you know outside, from scientists across the globe, and I just want to sort of, again give you a quick idea of the data cycle. So what's actually happening as that data comes into us? So starting at the top, as I say, you know the data is being generated, and the first thing that's being done, obviously, is it's submitted to us. So it's actually a, a small picture of part of the EBI building here. So the data submitted. Obviously, the first thing we'll do is make sure we archive it, so you know we have that record of it, we've got it there. Um, along with any associated um, data or metadata that's been sent in with it. Um, we will obviously classify it to make sure that, yes, what you've said, the data is, is what we think it is, that we've got it in the right place, that we know it's gone to the correct database. And again, making sure that all of the required information that comes with it so that it is usable by others is also there. Um, this classification is done by both by manual automatic terms. Manually, we actually have a whole group of bio curators who work very closely with people who are submitting data to make sure that, again, that submission process is done so that we've, we've you know, got all of the information that we need. The next big thing we do is obviously share it. And this is why I've got it in a different color year, because this is what we spend a lot of time doing is being able to share that data and be able to provide um, a way in which people can interact and explore that data as easily as possible. As well as sharing, there are other things we will do that as well. So with some of our databases, we will analyze the data as well. So we can put the, the data out there for you in a slightly different way. So you've got more meaning to it. So this is where we have um, databases such as Expression Atlas, where RNA sequence data that's been um, been submitted to other databases um, within the EBI is analysed for you and put out there so that you can focus simply on the, on the gene expression um, details rather than having to do the full analysis yourself. We also develop tools so that again you can have different ways of interacting and exploring the data um, and you know each resource will have a different tool set um, associated with it. And then finally what we hope of course is that by sharing this data by enabling people to look at the data in different ways if for example if we've analyzed it or you know providing different tools then this data will be reused by others so whether it's that you know this data is being used as the the start point for a project maybe to try and build a hypothesis first before going into the lab and new data is generated or whether it's adding two data sets so for example if you've done some research yourself but you need to expand upon the the amount of data you have or that that particular data set they may well be relevant data again within the resources that you can pull in and add to that and again expand your particular piece of research as well. So as I say, this is the, the data cycle that, that we go through. And you know, the idea is that by reusing it, hopefully then we're also stimulating further data generation. So again, we'll get more, um, more data coming back into the archives. And for a number of the resources, we do have um, submitters who are submitting data on a very regular basis with us as well. In terms of the volumes of data and the types of data, there are a number of different types. And uh, you know, you can already see, I think, from the amount of, of data storage we have that we have huge volumes of data here available. And this little graph just really gives you an indication of uh, some of the variety in data that we have, but also the growth of this as well. So I think sometimes people expect us to have lots of genomic sequence, but you know, what else do we have? So you can see a range of things here. So as I say, things like you know, structural data, imaging data, etc. And you can see that actually a number of these have, have really grown as well in terms of the volume of data. So as more people are encouraged to submit, as more databases come online to accept this data as well, the, obviously the amount of, of data will go up. In terms of the variety, so as I said, you know, there's a, a huge variety of, of data that we, we, do, um, we do take in and that we you know, enable to be shared. And this diagram here really gives you the whole um, set of data resources that, that uh, we, we are able to offer at, at Embl EBI. So starting with things like chemicals, molecules, these are things that maybe sometimes people aren't a little surprised that we have. So things like Kebby and Kemble, which are focused on, on um, chemical entities, um, and things like metabolites, again, which look more at metabolomics um, 
and these sorts of, of data. We have obviously our genes, genomes and RNA. So you may know resources such as Ensemble, so our genome browser and things like Expression Atlas, which is functional genomics. Um, Magnify focused on, on metagenomics and then some quite specific um, resources such as our farm RNA Central looking at various aspects of, of RNA. From the protein point of view, we have um, uh, resources such as Uniparts where you'll find sequence information or Pride where you find um, proteomics information through to things like PDB where you've got then full structures. Um, so structures across a range of different um, different proteins. And we've also now, of course, got the link with the we've got the AlphaFold database where we've got um, a whole range of computed structures as well. On the imaging side of things, we have some very specific archives for imaging, both in sort of bioimages generally, which contains a whole range of different types, as well as things like the electron microscopy data bank. And then through to genetic variation disease, um, early in 2020, early in the, the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we developed a data platform to enable the collection and sharing of COVID-19 data um, across the globe, and especially across Europe. Um, and then we also have variation archives such as the European Genome Phenome Archive and, and the European Variation Archive. And finally, then we have those which are more sort of knowledge management, literature based. So Europe PMC, so Europe PubMed Central, which is a, a, a literature database. And then um, again, databases which help in terms of managing um, the knowledge and, and managing the resources which link into some of the other databases as well. All of these databases are fully accessible. The only caveat here is with the European Genome Phenome Archive, where because this particular resource contains not only um, sequence data, but also sensitive patient data, so confidential data, there is an extra step to accessing it. So if you would like to access any of the data sets within the, the EGA, then all of them will come with a data access committee request as well. But, you know, if you have a, a relevant reason, a good scientific reason, you can prove that, again, you will take care of that data, um, then, you know, you have got the opportunity to apply for access to those data sets. The EVA actually takes some of the, the variation data from the EGA and removes that confidential element to it as well, so you can still interact with the variation data. You can also see on this arrow and at the side that there's a, a number of, of images of, of different species and this leads quite nicely into the next slide where again we have data it's not just lots of different data types but there's data for many species as well so you know we're not just talking human and mice there's a whole range of different species that we hold data for in terms of interactions between them obviously it's, it's all biological data but biological data is linked so there are a number of interactions between the resources so different resources will feed into others or we'll have links between them the main thing being that you know making sure that you as a user can easily move between data types as well so for example in ensemble there will be um, links to things like uniprot identifiers or to expression atlas identifiers so that, you know, if you have a gene there, you can quickly move out and, and look at the protein data or you can look at the gene expression data. Um, and to say that in terms of adding additional information, again, some of those resources are used so that that extra information could be added to those databases. The final thing in, in terms of kind of working with others is also then the database collaboration. So, you know, we, are, we aren't the only host of major databases across the world. And a number of the databases will mirror information or will share large sets of information across them as well. So a nice example here is, is the PDB. So the Protein Data Bank, um, there is the Protein Data Bank in Europe um, and there is the Protein Data Bank as well. So again, you know, the, the data that's shared between the two, um, it's the same data. What's different is maybe the way in which you, you can review the data. So there's different tools and things that are available. This collaboration really is essential. Again, it's essential in definitely making the, the open data sustainable and making it possible for people to access. Also makes it easier by having mirrors, you know, across the world again, means that it's easier for people to, to access some of this. Um, and as I say, it's just working really across this whole global scientific community to make sure that the data is being, out, being put out, that is being shared and is usable by many. 
final thing on really around the, the services and what we're doing generally is that, you know, we are used by many. I said at the beginning that, you know, in terms of that data generation submission, we accept submissions from across the globe. And again, people are accessing the data from across the globe as well. And we actually have this little this little map live on the website where you can see where those hotspots of users are. And as you go through the day, I'll see the hotspots change um, as the day, the day sort of moves across the world. So now I'm going to take you briefly through how you can actually work your way through the EBI, the Emble EBI resources. So again, we spent a lot of time trying to make this an easy process so that you know it's as easy as, as we can get to help you get to you know the source of the data as quickly as we can really, but also trying to make sure that you know you're getting to the right data fairly quickly as well. So this is just a quick snapshot of our front page, and you've got the website at the bottom here. And this is actually a photo from today, so this is what it looks like currently. And simpler thing, if there is a particular gene or protein or chemical that you, you're interested in, um, or you know, family of genes that you, you want to know about and you want to see maybe where can you find that data, the quickest thing to do is to actually use this search box on the front page. This is our, our own um, Emble EBI search, so EBI search, and simply pop your gene or protein chemical name in the box. And then you will end up coming up obviously with a, a search. So this is the kind of search results that you, you may well get. For some of our genes and proteins, you will actually find that there are gene and protein summaries in existence for them. So the example I've got here is MSTM, which is myostatin. And if you plug that into the EBI search, you will actually come up with a set of gene and protein summaries, which will give you a snapshot into the data that you'll find within each of the resources. You can see on this side here as well, obviously, you you have a general search result list here as well. And this is another way of then being able to click through to the particular um, area of interest or data of interest that you're looking at. If you, however, want to focus on the gene and protein summaries, by clicking on this button here, you'll come through to the actual gene and protein summary pages. And so it's laid out to really be able to give you quick and easy snapshot of information and quick links through to where you can find that information as well. So the side here you can see you've got gene information. So this is um, all from Ensemble, our genome browser. Um, expression will take you through to Expression Atlas. So we'll give you all of the information around the functional genomic side of things. Proteins will take you through to um, Uniprot, PDB, oh no, sorry, PDBs in the structure. Um, Uniprot and things such as Interpro. Um, then protein structures obviously take you through to PDB and show you whether there are any protein structures available. And then literature at the bottom takes you through to Europe PMC. And again, we'll give you links to um, papers, to review articles, um, which mention myostatin. So I'm just going to show you quickly if you click on gene, what you get again is a direct link to Ensemble. Um, so this is a, an, a gene page from Ensemble, and here you can see you've got information there about the gene, so you know um, where you will actually find it. Um, you can have a look at the transcript for it. It will show you the location, chromosome, etc. Um, and there will be various links then to, to other bits of information about that particular gene as well. So say the idea is that it's a really quick way to be able to get in and actually find information about that gene and protein. If you want to instead go in and look for a particular data resource or a particular tool, so rather than starting from that point of gene or protein, you actually want the data resource, then again, back to the front page and you'll find this handy button, um, which, you know, find data resources. So clicking on this will take you through to the Emble EBI services page, and this has recently been updated. Um, and what you'll find, as I say, is, is this page here. And if you look here, you have a, a short list of, of some featured resources. So there's a set of data resources and you've got a set of featured tools. Um, again, you've got a search box, you can add a search in. So if it's a particular resource or you know, you're looking for a protein related resource, you could type that in. Or as I say, if you click on this link here to explore all our data resources and tools. This takes you through to this page. Again, you've got the search box, but here you've now got a list of all of the resources. Um, these are ordered by featured at the moment, but again, um, it's featured in, in alphabetical order. What you've got at the side, however, again, if you're not sure of the name of the resource you're looking for, 
we have this category list that you can use to filter the results. So again, if you know that you're looking, for example, for something which has some chemical biology information, by clicking on this, it will take you through to Kemble and Kebby. Or again, if you click on gene expression, it will take you through to expression atlas or single cell expression atlas as your results. So again, if you, you know, not entirely sure, but you know the type of data you're looking for, by using this filter list, you can work your way through to the, the resource or set of resources that may be of interest. One thing that you may want to do if you're working with large sets or if you're trying to um, create pipelines, you may want to access the data resources programmatically. So a number of the resources enable you to do this. And each of the resources that does will have information. So here's just an example from, from Uniprot and, and Ensemble where um, there is information on the website about the APIs that are available. Um, but we also then have some additional training. So this was a, a webinar series that was initially run a couple of years ago. Now, see the information has been updated. Um, there is an initial webinar just giving you a bit of information about APIs and why you might want to use them. But then for each of the resources which have an API, again, there is a short webinar which will talk you through how you can use the, the APIs and, and again, where to access more information. I mentioned data submission at the beginning. Obviously, we talked about you know the, the data cycle and the reasons for data submission. And again, um, submitting data is something you can do from the front page. So this next box will take you through to our data submission um, page and through to this data submission wizard. So really, I think I've told you these, these sort of things already as to why you should be thinking about submitting your data. And so really it is to, to make the most of the data that's generated and that's making the most for you as the generator of the data and for others to actually be able to make more from it as well. The one thing to remember, of course, is that you will get recognition um, for that data as well. And, you know, there are, there are DOIs and things attached to it. So as people are reusing the data, they will be citing those data sets as well. So you will get recognition. It may well be also that, you know, people will find other things in the data that, that you didn't find. So, you know, they there may be other things that you might carry on with as well. But to go back to the actual submission piece, again, I mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the by curators, et cetera, who work with us to try and, you know, to work on these submission process who will work with you. If you're trying to work out where you should be submitting, this is where the submission was, comes in. Because again, it starts by asking you what type of data have you got, and then it will take you through and suggest which of the data repositories you should go for. And there is a list, of so this is a, a cut off here, because it's a, a screenshot, but there's a longer list on the website of all of the data repositories that take direct submissions as well. But if in doubt, please do contact, and I will show you a little bit later in the presentation how you can um, get in touch with our, um, our data resources. But again, you know, do speak to them. If you're thinking of submitting data to a resource, again, it's worth speaking to them early because then you can find out about the process, find out about you know, what's required. So data is submitted to particular data standards. So that requires data to be um, provided in a specific format with a specific set of metadata, et cetera, added with it. So again, it's worth thinking about that early and working out what you need from the beginning rather than getting to the point of thinking, now I need to submit my data and suddenly having to retrofit a load of stuff into it. So do have a chat to especially the curators in those particular repositories so you can get more information from them early. If you are using our data resources and tools, please do remember to cite them, okay? So it's not just citing the data sets, do cite the resources and tools as well. And we do keep track of where people are using them um, because obviously we want to know that people are actually using them and are, you know, gaining benefit from doing so. In terms of citing, as I say, the, the, the data within them is um, uh, openly accessible. And actually in our new services page, it tells you a little bit more detail by each of the data resources. So you've got the different Creative Commons licenses here that go with it. And actually here you've got an example of where it will even tell you that this particular resource has an API. The one thing to remember is record when you access the resource or tool. These tools and resources do change over time. Obviously, as new releases, new information becomes available, new formats, um, you know, and things are subject to change. So do record when you accessed it. So, you know, if someone queries, hang on, this looks a bit different, you can say, well, no, this was this version, then up to this version. So that, you know, again, you can you can make sure that what you're presenting is, is correct at that time. Um, in terms of citations, then resources will tell you their preferred way. So again, this is taken off the Uniprot website. 
um, which you know says if you're going to cite us, please consider citing this. There are some other suggestions as well if there are particular elements of the tool or the resource that you want to cite as well. But again, have a look on the website, it will tell you what they suggest. Finally, I want to just take you through a couple of things around training and support because, as I say, you know, we've the, the resource um, team spent a long time making these resources that they, they, you know, easy to use, easy to find. But again, we make sure there is, is plenty of training and plenty of support so that you can really get to grips with how to use the resource, what kind of things you can do, um, and you're know, thinking about the types of data that's there. Um, and, you know, if you do get stuck, there are always people there who are happy to help as well. And, and you know, if there's things you think you should be able to do, they will work with you to try and find, see if there is a way that you can do it within the, the resource as it is. So quickly to mention us again as, as EBI training. So obviously, um, hopefully you've all found our website, which is how you got here today to, to register for this particular webinar. Um, but our, our training is, is divided into these, these three sort of categories. So the live training, which this webinar is part of, and that also includes um, live longer courses that we run on site at Tingston and things we run virtually as well. Our on-demand training, which I'm going to talk you through in a little more detail, and also support for trainers. So trainers, teachers, lecturers who are also trying to um, teach bioinformatics, and um, whether that be resource-based or bioinformatics analysis, in their um, various institutions as well. So, so I'm going to focus a little more on the on-demand training um, and just really sort of talk you through some of the, um, the options we have with this. And this is something we've been working on a lot again over the, the past couple of years, especially over this year, there's been quite a number of, of new exciting changes out there to enable you to do even more with the site. So our on-demand training is very much self-paced learning, developed by Emble EBI experts. You can drop in and out and do whatever you want, whenever you want, basically. It's all openly available. So it started with these online tutorials. So these are anything from sort of 30 minutes up to three hours. And these are on either specific EBI resource, Emble EBI resources, or key topics in bioinformatics. So again, short, distinct sort of pieces of, of learning. Um, and you can start at any point. You don't have to start at the beginning of the course. If you know some of the stuff already and just want to drop in partway through, you can do. What we also then have a more curated collection. So these are longer sets. So these are things where you may have a number of online tutorials, a couple of webinars, um, some, some course material. So it will take you longer to work through, but they provide a more in-depth view on a slightly broader topic, basically. So we have collections, for example, of a chemical biology collection. We have one focused on, on curation um, and one that's a more general introduction to bioinformatics as well. So webinars, Anna mentioned at the beginning that obviously this one's live today, but we do record them all. And there is a library of all our recorded webinars that you can also look through and where we have done some of these special series as well. So where we have a collection of, of related webinars. So again, the videos tend to be sort of fairly short, tend to be about 30 to 40 minutes in length, and you can work your way through those as well at your own pace. They're all there for you. And the final thing that we've, we did, um, a lot of work on last year then we've been able to launch more than this year is enabling people to have easier access to our course material sets after a live course has happened so we've always made them available they're now much more available or available in a much a much nicer and easier to use format than we had previously um basically this is a whole set of, of things like powerpoint presentations of practical exercises um with some lecture material um so that you know if you weren't able to attend a live course you can still access the learning from it that learning is slightly different because it tends to be a little less focused on the emblebi resources but will be focused on different types of bioinformatics analysis in terms of software again so where we have practicals um, there will also be a list of all the software that's required to actually do the practical as well and also we try and put in all the links to the data sets as well so you can actually go and have a go yourself <clears throat> One of the things we've worked a lot on this year is also enabling you to keep better track of your on-demand learning as well. So as you're, you're working at your own pace, being able to keep track of what you're doing. So here's an example of a course that we've got, Human Genetic Variation. So the first thing you can do 
um, and you need to create an account for this. So to access the on-demand materials, you don't actually need an account, but if you want to then start keeping track of what you're doing, you will need to create one. Again, it's all completely free. Um, you can mark a course as a favorite, so you can keep track of at least, you know, I have an intention to, to do something with this particular course. Once you then um, start working through that, um, each of the sections will have a markers complete button, which when you click, it will get added to your course progress across the top here. So you can always see where you are. And as I say, you don't have to work through in a linear manner. You can jump in and out of this as you want to. And by having an account as well, you can also keep track of any quiz results, etc. You then have your own account. So this is a snapshot for my learning account here. So you can see the courses that you have in progress. So this is the, the course I've just shown, genetic variation. Um, so, you know, from your account, you can just jump straight back into where you were before. You also have a list of completed courses and you have a list of any other courses that you've added to your favorites list. I mentioned teachers, trainers, lecturers and support for trainers. And again, this is just to point out that if we have teachers, trainers, lecturers on the call, or, you know, if you are working with teachers or trainers who are looking for this kind of material, then we really are trying to encourage trainers again to, you know, at least start with the MBBR resource materials, because again, if you're trying to teach the resources, we have probably the most up-to-date materials. You know, our material is updated very regularly and it's written by the experts who know those resources well. But also if you're just looking for inspiration or looking for new materials in topics, then again, the post course materials can also be used for the same purpose. So, you know, you can look through those and again, you can use those in your own teaching. Main thing to say at this point really is this is something we're working on at the moment. So we are trying to grow how we actually provide this support. And the main thing we'd like to say is, you know, do get in touch with us because we're interested to know what people are trying to do, where people are trying to find things and to see what we can do to help provide you support, but also enable you to share your ideas with others as well. For general help around MBLEBI resources, the main thing is that every single database will have a help section and they really do have help desks with people behind them. So when you send a fill in a contact form or send an email, there will be a real person at the end of it who will get back to you with a response um, and, you know, may well talk to you quite significantly about what you're trying to do. The resource teams really do like to hear from people. They like to hear from people, you know, when they're trying to do things, or when they're stuck or when they've got ideas of other things they'd like to be able to do. These resources are constantly being updated. They're, you know, looking at new ways of being able to explore the data as well. And often when these, these updates are being made, it's based on discussions with users over the kind of things that they're trying to do. So here's a quick example from Uniprot um, where this is the, the front page of the website and you can see straight away there's this help button on the left hand side. So by clicking on this, it'll take you through to the help center. Um, so you've got several um, sort of uh, several tiles here that you can click on and several things you can go and have a look through. And again, there's a set of FAQs to help get you started. If those don't address the kind of thing you're looking for, and the nice thing is there's a link to the online training courses here, there's a get in touch box here and this will take you through to a contact form. So again, you can fill in the form and you know tell them what it is you're trying to do, tell them who you are, et cetera, and they will get back to you and will you know, obviously try and provide any help and support they can to enable you to do the thing you're trying to do. So as I say, real people, please do try. And actually a number of the people who, if you attend some of the Rebel EBI webinars, the people you will hear speaking on the webinars are often the people who are manning the the kind of help desks as well and we'll be answering your uh, your queries. Finally, if you want to know a little bit more, um, there's an annual kind of update. So we have our annual um, Emberley BI reports anyway, but there is always an annual update in, in NAANI, Claire Cass's research, um, which gives a, an overview of the, of the previous year, gives you some highlights, um, any new data resources, any new tools, bits of research, training, etc. Um, so the 2021 one was, was published in, in January this year and again January next year there'll be an overview of, of this year giving you again links into to new things that have happened. Finally, before I end, I just wanted to flag up again a couple more webinars. So there is a webinar tomorrow. So if you are um, a user of, of Uniprot or want to become a user of Uniprot, there is actually a fantastic webinar which will guide you through the new and improved website. 
um, recently launched, um, looks quite different. There's lots of different things you can do in it. So please, again, if you've used Union Prop Night User for a while, do come along and, and see that, that, that tour through. Um, the other thing then is we've got some webinars coming up to support some of our online learning. So I mentioned about the collections we've got and, and the, the tutorials. We have this collection on introductory bioinformatics, which is a, a nice start point for those of you who might be new to bioinformatics and just trying to work your way around. And to help support people who are working through this, we have some Q&A question and answer webinars. Um, so the idea is that if you've started to have a look through the collection and then you want to speak to the experts more specifically, we have two sessions. Um, one on genes and gene expression and one on proteins and structure. So again, you can register for these and come along and ask the experts your questions about these particular topics. With that, I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, there are numerous ways in which you can stay in touch with us. I would encourage you to do so. Um, obviously, you've, we've given you the, the EBI website details already. We're also on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel. Um, and I will say that, again, all of the individual resources, do look out if you use one of the resources a great deal. Things like Ensemble, Uniprot, etc. have Twitter feeds. Keep in touch with them because then you'll get to know as new things are happening. With that, Anna has reappeared, so I will stop talking um, and say thank you again for listening. And I think we'll go to answer some questions now. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, yes, we can go to answer some questions. Um, there's some questions already, but if you do have more, please um, pop those into the Q&A box. You'll see the little Q&A icon where you can type your questions into. Uh, but if we take a look at some of the ones we have already, um, there's, there's a couple that are linked, so I wanted to, to join those ones together. And you talk quite a bit about submitting data to the various resources. Um, and there's a question about what's actually the advantage of submitting data to an EBI resource over some of the others that may be available. Um, and the one that um, I would like to sort of link in there is that a question around are NCBI resources linked to our uh, resources? They kind of go a bit hand in hand, I think. So I'll start with the NCBI one first and say that, yes, there are some um, NCBI databases that are linked. Um, and this is why I've got to try and get in my brain which ones are linked. Um, but genome browsers, again, we share the information, so the genome information is shared. Um, things like Array Express and Geo, there is a sharing of a, a certain, so it's not the whole data set, but there is a, a large proportion of that data set which is shared between as well. What differs there is, is often the tools, and this is the same thing like sort of I mentioned about PDB. Sometimes it's it's the way in which the data is displayed is different and the tools that you have available to you to then explore the data that differs between. Um, also, there are differences obviously in terms of things like the APIs available and, and the ways in which you can download the data. In terms of submitting, um, again, then I think it, it sometimes comes down to the, the process of submission and which process you use. You know, sometimes people will have a favorite data resource they use. So some people like PDB, some people like PDB. I think again with the, with the submission side of things, um, you know there are some databases which are obviously quite specific and, and niche to, to very particular data types, you know, um, and obviously there is is a, is a great benefit there from from maybe if you have that very specific data type going there. Um, with others, I guess it's looking at you know how sustainable. There's obviously a discussion often about you know do you use an academic or your institutional repository versus us you know, the sustainability of the resource maybe. But, you know, sometimes it can also be down to, you know, what's the, the level of support, I guess, that you're getting and, you know, how easy is it to, to do that data submission? So um, hopefully that helps answer that one. I'm sure it does. Um, I suppose the, the other answer is lots of our resources work in similar ways. So once you've kind of gotten the hang of, of um, where to find data from some resources, it might make it either be easier to find others. Um, but that again is a, a preference thing too. Um, so moving to think a bit about more about training, uh, there is a question around um, scholarships or um, funding available for courses, and as well as that, a question around is are there free courses available as well? So all of our online content, so all of the the on demand content is freely available um, for courses. Aside from 
webinars as live courses as, as live elements for the live courses where it's anything from sort of a, a day onwards they do generally come with a fee so um, our virtual fees are obviously less than on-site fees if you're attending an on-site course the fee is higher because it does come with all of the accommodation refreshments etc because essentially we look after you for that whole week you don't have to think about anything else that you need to do apart from actually do the course um, we do sometimes have funding available um, we don't have it as a, an availability for every single course, but occasionally where, where we have particular grant funding that's coming with the course, we, we may well be able to offer um, bursaries, etc. for those. Um, but we do always encourage people who are applying for courses to again look to see if they have local sources of funding um, or if you're a member of certain professional bodies and this kind of thing, then you may well be able to apply for, for funding to attend courses from those as well. Thank you. And I'm just typing in a, an answer to someone else's question um, while uh, while you are talking. Um, so there's also a question around resources specific for fungi. Um, and I know there's not one specific for fungi itself um, from the EBI, but there are a number of databases that do have some uh, fungi data in them. So the obvious one that springs to mind is Ensemble um, and Uniprop. I don't know if there's any others uh, we can think of on top of our head, um, but not specific um, solely for, for fungi. Top of my head, I can't think that. But again, it's it's it would be that kind of you know depending on what sort of data you're looking for, go to the resource and and literally look for, for organism or species. You know because the when you're looking at the the individual data resources and you're doing the searches. Um, you can search by by organism, so that's the best thing to do. Really, so look at it. I, I, it may well even be that you can add fungi in as an EBI search term and see what what gets thrown up as well. That's a good place to start. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just following on from from your answers around the the training question, um, about funding. Someone also asked if the as the places are limited for the courses, can they be added to a priority list? And we do have a process around that um, already. So I didn't know whether you wanted to mention a bit about how that works. So in, in terms of applications, yes. Um, unfortunately, with, with the courses, we do have limited numbers. Um, so it tends to be 30 places per course. Um, where Because they're done through selection. So, you know, we you make an application, we then select. Um, we will always try and keep a waiting list. So, you know, for example, if people aren't able to, to join us, we can then add others in quickly onto, onto that list. What we will always do, however, is, you know, if people aren't able to attend, then, you know, this is where at least being able to provide all the course materials afterwards is at least, you know, you, you do get access to all of those. And we make sure that everybody who applied for a course, even if they, they weren't offered a place, we email them all afterwards to say the course materials are here. So at least they know they can access them as well. Um, and, you know, please do try again the following year to, to join. Unfortunately, yes, the numbers are high and, you know, we're not able to to deliver more than once a year. But this is why we, as I say, try and get those materials out there. And, you know, if we can get recordings of of lectures and things out as well so that people are still able to access it even if they can't attend in person. Great, right, thank you. Um, and going back to more on the data side, we have the question, um, is it possible to automatically integrate EBI data into your own data portal? Um, and who would be the best person to contact? So, yeah, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, so yes, it, it depends on the data resource um, is the first answer. Um, the programmatic access that many of the resources allow will, would allow you to do that. Um, it, it very much depends on the data resource, but um, you could set something up that allows that. Um, the, the data is there, so if you can do it, you're welcome to do so. Um, all the data has a, a license that comes along with it. And this will be detailed on the website. So, for, for example, um, it may have a CC BY license, which may, means that you can use the data to do whatever you want, but you just have to say where it comes from. It comes from the EBI. Um, but your best port of call um, for information around the, that kind of data reuse is very much the help desk team that Sarah mentioned earlier on. If you're unsure, always, always go to them and uh, all the resources have one. So to get in contact with them. And um, I'm sure they would be, be willing to help because it's very much their aim to get the data out there as well. 
and to help you use it. Yes, and you know, if you being able to integrate it into your own portals is often better than trying to hammer the EBO website with lots and lots of requests as well in various ways. So you know, there's there's ways of doing it again. So they'd be happy to chat to you, and also the our um, web production teams as well. I think are always happy to help with some of that side of things as well. So yeah. Okay, and skipping back to the, the training side again, uh, we have a question um, saying if they're doing the on-demand online tutorials or they're reviewing webinars, um, how can they actually ask questions about those? If they they watch a recording, what can they do next? So if you watch, so say recordings of webinars and this kind of thing, then actually the person who delivered the webinar may often put their contact details so you can drop them an email. Um, or if they are from a particular resource, you can, again, contact the help desk, um, drop them a quick ticket and say, you know, or drop them a contact and, and say, you know, watch the webinar, could you answer? Or there is also the webinar's email address or, you know, getting in touch basically with the training team. And if a, um, a question comes through to us, we will then pass it on to the database as well. But say it's worth looking at who delivered it. Did they give you the contact details? Um, again, similarly with the the online tutorials as well. You know who's the author, and you should be able to drop that author an email directly. If you can't, we are happy in the training team to again help get those queries to the right people. And and usually at the end of the online tutorials, there is a page that says, if you're unsure about something, here's how to to get that that help. So do take a look at those ones, and they they obviously do differ. In the different online tutorials. Um, the, we had a question that um, Sarah and I are not going to be able to answer, but we can point you in the right direction. Uh, which kind of database technologies are we using? So that's, um, they give the, a couple of examples there. It again depends very much on the, the data resource. They will all be built on different technologies. Um, some of them detail the kind of technologies they have in their about pages, others don't. Um, but if you have a specific resource in mind, um, again, you can contact them about that. But um, if it's a way in which you are going to be able to access the data programmatically, it will be explained on the website. If you want to know more about the, the technical infrastructure side of things, you could also get in touch with our technical services team through the About Us pages, because, again, they may be quite happy to have a chat to you about the kind of things that they're using and the kind of setups around the EBI. So. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Um, there is a question uh, about webinar recordings. Yes, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will email everyone tomorrow who has registered um, to let you know that that recording is live. Um, and we do we do this with all our webinars. So if you see something in the future that you know you're not going to be able to attend, um, don't worry, it will be recorded anyway. So. Um, that's there. And also feel free to share those links with um, any colleagues um, or anyone you think might be uh, might find it useful. Um, but yes, absolutely. They're all online in our on demand section um, going back a, a good couple of years. We refresh them to make sure they're up to date. Um, but all the content is there for you to use. Um, and we also supply the um, slides to go along with them. So if you'd rather work through it in that way. No. I think maybe we can do a couple more questions before we finish. Um, there is a, a question, a, a really general question, um, saying, I'd like to study bioinformatics. Where can I find online courses? Um, and whilst we have um, the more recent data resource based content on our site, we do also have a lot of introductory um, more conceptual um, side of, of biology and bioinformatics um, on our site. So I really do recommend taking a look um, at our site as well. Particularly, we have a set section called collections in the on-demand um, area of the site. And those um, are sort of collections of e-learning materials to kind of get you started on a specific topic. Um, but there's one, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, called introductory bioinformatics. And, and that's a, a good place to start. Um, Sarah, is any anywhere beyond our website that you would recommend? Um, I think one 
good place to have a look at actually. So under Elixir, um, which I mentioned earlier, there's again been a, a really good project to try and bring together a whole catalogue of training across Europe. And that's a combination of um, live training and online training as well. So there's something called TESS, which is the um, training support system, um, which I think, I don't know if Anna can type the details um, into the, the chat. Um, but again, TESS is a good place to, to have a search through because there's a whole range of different different things that you will find there. Um, and as I say, again, nice links out to um, some online content. Um, also, again, it depends whether it's, it's bioinformatics or whether you want some of the basic coding stuff as well. And um, for things like that, it's worth looking at some of the, the, um, the courses that the Carpentries do because there's some nice introductory things there. Um, but again, I think this—I think this is the good thing at the moment. There is there is quite a lot out there. Um, it's just finding the 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 course that's right for you. Really, is giving you the information that you need. Um, the one thing I would say is, if you're new to it and you're just starting out in some of this stuff, if you can find yourself a bioinformatician who will happily chat to you as well, that's always a good thing, because I think it's good to have somebody there who again can just help guide you through. Um, some of the, the things that you might need to think about um, and you know if you do start doing some of the analysis yourself or doing some coding it's, it's worth having someone there who you can at least chat to and and work through some things with so yeah I've just dropped the link for tests into the chat there so do um, go and have a look at that one to okay. see lots and lots of different content there's an interesting question I've spotted somebody's asked about the integrity of the data which I think is, a, is also a good one to comment on at this point, actually. So obviously someone, you know, with the, with the question about why submit and think about data integrity, um, I guess we look at this in a number of different ways because when the data is being submitted, this is why we do spend some time actually looking at what is being submitted, making sure that, you know, it's it makes sense. You know, that's one of the things, actually. So it's looking at, you know, the, the format that all of the relevant metadata that's submitted with it. So say this is the added information that makes it usable also makes sense. Um, you know, you, you do the curator, all of the curators from the different resources will will likely have stories of where something's been submitted, which, you know, you've got odd descriptions of, of organisms and samples and things. So, you know, again, that's one thing that's done at the beginning is really checking through all of that, that data as it's been submitted and, and then it's being done in a standard manner. In terms of then obviously having it on the website, again, we make sure that when we're sharing it, we're sharing it in a way that, you know, again, all of that is is there, all of it's held, you know, we're not going to lose any bits of it, all of the relevant information that's needed, all of that data is there for you. So again, you know, it's it's that's part of the whole piece around the sustainability of the data is making sure that everything's there that you need. So it's something that we obviously take very, you know, we know we've got great responsibility for that so making sure that it's it's good as it's coming in and then it's in in the right thing and then as we're putting it out there that there's no changes being made etc so it is as you expect to find it thank you um so we've come up to half past now so i think we should probably um be wrapping up but just one final question i wanted to answer um there's a question around a certificates um, given for attendees of webinars this isn't something that we do, um, but what we would recommend is that when you receive the um, email tomorrow about the recording, in that it does confirm that you were actually at the webinar, the, the title of the, um, the email confirms that. Um, but also, if you um, have become uh, able to log in to our website, if you fill in the form and register for the website, um, you are then able to mark webinars as complete and you're able to then see them in your list of completed courses in your My Learning section on the website. So that's a really good way of, sort of demonstrating to a supervisor or whoever it is that you've um, been completing um, online training from, from the UBI. So hopefully you'll find that useful. So yeah, um, registering for our website does have some, some great benefits, um, even though all the content is absolutely freely available to, to use and to watch, um, even if you don't register. Okay, so with that, I think we will finish for today. But if you do have any further questions that you want to get in contact with uh, with us about, please do email us. But as, as we kind of covered in a number of answers to the questions, contacting the uh, help desks for the data resource that you're wanting to use directly is often the way to go. 
Okay, so um, before we finish, is there anything else that you wanted to add, Sarah? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that the main thing I'd say is obviously check out the next um, sets of webinars that are coming. Um, there's the webinars that, that we're organising. There's the nice Uniprot um, set that's coming as well. And, you know, if you are, obviously there's a few people here just starting off. So do take a look at the introductory collection and come and join us for the Q&A webinars. So uh, yeah, absolutely. thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. And I hope to see you at a webinar in the next few weeks.